And hey, everybody, welcome to episode 18 of the Husek Cast, the Husek Con podcast. Today, Sam and I are talking to David Balcar. David is a native Houstonian that moved up to the Northeast. We talk about some of his weather up there. And we're also talking about his talk at Husek Con back in 2023 on insider threat, getting a little history on David, how he got into the industry, and just generally having a good talk and letting him scare everybody a little bit. So enjoy the episode. Sam, how you doing, man? I am great. How are you doing? Welcome back. You missed an episode. I did miss an episode. Thank you for uh, taking it for me there. And uh, I know it's Roy is great to to have on the show. Um, and you two have such similar backgrounds in the OT space. I, I think it was a perfect one. So thank you very much. Uh, tell Roy, I said, I'm sorry that I was not there. But appreciate you taking that. Will do. We missed you. Well, I missed it too, but I am back and we've got another great guest in Mr. David Balcar, Principal Cybersecurity Strategist. How are you doing, David? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks for having me today. I hear it's uh, at the time of recording anyway of this. It's a little chilly up in your neck of the woods. It is. We had a little bit of snow uh, a couple of days ago, uh, so hopefully that's the end of the snow in the Northeast uh, for the rest of this year. We're definitely looking for some some April, spring uh, weather for sure. Well, that's what you get being a native Houstonian and moving to the Northeast. I mean, we, I, I know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, for those of you who don't know, David, uh, David has been at Husek on multiple, multiple times, has spoken multiple times. He is a, a valued speaker and presenter at Husek Con, uh, Houston native. We'll get into all things uh, Mr. Balcar here in a little bit. And a little known fact, I will say, is he. Uh, did the first Houston B-Sides way back in the day, um, which I was uh, very happy to be a part of as well. So I wish you would come back down here and run it because nobody's running that darn thing. But um, what are you going to do? Uh, yeah, stay tuned. I'll, I'm trying to make some moves on that. So Awesome. Well, good to hear. Good to hear. Well, let's um, before we get into talking everything about you, David, we're going to get into a Houston Con segment, do a little news segment. You gave us a cool article to talk about. And uh, then we'll get on the rest of the show. So speaking of Husek Con, we've already made this announcement, but uh, Sam, I think you want to talk about something cool going on at Husek Con 2024. Yeah, yeah, we are super excited. We just announced this by by this out. We, we've already announced it. Um, but Gene Spafford's coming to be our keynote, our opening keynote. Super excited to have Gene down here. Spaff, as known by many, um, so a, a long you know, history and, and colorful history in cyber and uh, really excited to hear his uh, words of wisdom for us in our community. So um, yeah, get those tickets, get those tickets. Yep. Do man. Cause he's, what do you say about the SPAF, man? He's, he's done everything. He pretty much almost invented our industry, right? I mean, the guy's just a legend. Um, so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm super excited. Sam's been working on the, getting him lined up for, I don't know, weeks now. Um, obviously he's an in-demand kind of guy. So very, very happy. Thanks Sam for putting in all the effort. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But thanks to Gene for considering us and, and giving absolutely. us time to, to be down here with us. Right. And, and amongst that, we have other keynotes, right? And I think you've got somebody to talk about too. Yeah. Uh, Andy Ellis is going to be a mid conference uh, keynote. So if you don't know, Andy used to be the CISO at Akamai. He's over at IL Ventures now, YL Ventures now, um, Prince, or like a partner over there, uh, super, super smart guys, keynoted RSA conference and several other conferences. So uh, he's, we had him last year kind of as a remote speaker, our only remote speaker we had because he had last minute. Uh, but he's going to be coming in as well. I'm really excited to have him in. Uh, he's uh, going to do some, lay some wisdom down on us as well. So very excited about that. It's great. A lot going on. And then two weeks, by, by the time this release, will be of almost two weeks to uh, OTSEC on. So, uh, which is taken off like crazy. Like I'm super excited about that one. So, and hopefully folks have gotten their ticket by now and uh, you know, we'll see everybody very shortly. Yeah, I think it is probably going to be sold out by the time we get this thing on the air. So we'll see about that. Uh, we've also got uh, here in about two weeks at, when we put this one out, we'll have uh, the HUSECCON user group for April, I believe, coming up. That's always on the last Thursday of the uh, of the month. So if you haven't got into that one, 
Uh, you can do the next one, but Lynn No is coming in. He's going to be, I think we talked, you talked about that on the last podcast too, Sam, but uh, Lynn is um, what he calls himself transhuman because he's got a bunch of stuff inserted in him. He does all kinds of cool stuff. He's, he's just very entertaining. He did the closing keynote a couple of years ago uh, at HUSECCON as well. So um, super entertaining. Glad to have him come down. Um, and then we've got the call for papers opening up not too long as well, right? May 1st. And we're going to, we are doing a 30 day window. So the month of May is the time to submit your talk. And, uh, looking forward, we expect a pretty good response there because we need some time to, to call through everything. And we'd like to get the agenda out earlier than we usually do. So that's why we're doing this earlier in the year than we have been. Usually we're doing it in the July, July timeframe. Uh, we want to get this agenda out and as soon as we can for everybody now, as, as big as we're getting, we need to be a little bit more, uh, you know, ahead of things than we have been in the past. So, all right. Well, that's it for the HUSECCON segment. So David, you gave us a pretty cool and kind of scary, depending on how you look at it, but you always do that. You like to scare people. I've been enough of your talks to know you like freaking people out, but it's always entertaining. Uh, so tell us about um, your article over there at the PBS and um, give us kind of an intro on why you wanted to present it. Yeah, I think the, the big thing here is, you know, we hear about the, you know, elections having issues or hack this or hack that. And, you know, it's interesting that, you know, the U.S. and U.K. just announced uh, more sanctions on China, uh, especially two people linked to the Chinese government on hacking uh, voter registers and stuff around the, in the UK um, in the US as well. So it's interesting because what are they actually trying to do? Are they were they going after the voting machines? No, they were going after the uh, electoral systems themselves and going after the people behind them so they can get voter you know uh, rolls. Now I know a lot of people are going, oh if that's public Dave, we don't we don't care. Uh, it is public for a lot of it. Uh, but some of these other countries, it's not public. And what they're using, there's mass, think of it as mass surveillance, right? They're just sucking up all this information. And now they can use that uh, for extortion and for, hey, by the way, you better vote this way because we have this info on you. So I, th I think that's uh, where it's actually playing out. And it, that's that scares me more than just, you know, voting machines getting hacked, which they can. Um, I'm a paper ballot kind of guy. I, I like the stamp. Uh, so, uh, because I mean, if you look back, if we just look back at history, people are like, oh, no one's going to walk in there and hack these machines. Well, you know, just four months ago, another voting machine was hacked with a, uh, literally a pin cap and a, a spare smart card. I mean, it was really, really fast. He did it in less than 30 seconds. And then back in, if we look back to 2018 years and years ago, uh, a guy did the same thing. Uh, his name was Alex Hederman. He actually rolled machine up on stage at MIT stage and goes, watch this, did it, did it, and boom. He did all the votes for whoever he wanted to uh, with like zero effort. So um, I think it's that combination, you know, it's that, man, we've got that honeypot thing going over here with the Chinese uh, affecting multiple nations. They went after the UK mainly because the UK, there was a bunch of outspoken people saying, hey, China's bad, they're hacking us. Da, 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 da. Oh, okay. Well, now we're going to go after your elections. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the angle of trying to get at you. I mean, we've seen that all the way back, you know, with North Korea, when the Sony or with, you know, with the movies and everything coming out, I mean, they, it's, it's this come back at you type of mentality, but I mean, you've got between the election, uh, the voting machines, this type of influence than just social media in general and influencing people's votes and all of the misinformation that gets thrown out and so difficult to stop any of that. Um, if you can even see it and then with the advent of, of AI making everything even harder and more difficult to pick up, um, because of the nuance that it puts in any of these messages where you go, man, that, that looks real to me. That doesn't look, you know, there's no bad English or anything. It's, it, but what cracks me up, though, is that every time something like this comes out, the governments of whatever country is being affected is really quick. And they said this, the uh, election registers has not had an impact on electoral process. They're very quick 
to yeah. say, but this hasn't had any effect of, you know, on anything. It's like, we want you to have confidence in our voting process and our electoral process. But at the same time, there's all this bad crap happening. So and by the way, it, here's it, the way to make you. direction. Huh? But did you, did you, and by the way, the here's some sanctions for you. Yeah. Here's right, some sanctions. Exactly. Yeah. But if you read so, like another uh, two sentences uh, right after that, the key thing is, Oh, well, they breached us a year ago. It took us a year to find the breach. Okay, so what exactly did they do for a year in your network if you couldn't find them? Um, it, you sounds know, like everything else we've ever heard about, right? So sounds yeah. like uh, living off the land and and pretty much the way it is. My thing going back to the to the sanctions is, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not sure how effective they are. There's sanctions left. We're slinging sanctions left and right between everything else, the geopolitical issues across across the globe. How's it really helping? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, we just got to get better at the core discipline of securing these things, right? At the end of the day, because uh, I, I, I just don't know that we have the power to to really stop it at this point. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely very tough, especially Michael. You brought up you know AI uh, on both sides. You know, I'm seeing more on the AI from the bad guy side, right? Um, doing phishing emails and, you know, make them very human readable and all that kind of stuff and helping with social engineering. But what about using AI on the defense side? I don't, I don't hear any of these dominion or any of these electoral uh, systems state, you know, state by state or even other countries. Well, what do you have for defense? How are you trying to defend against this? And I never hear that. I mean, that's one huge gaping hole that you never hear about. You can Google it to start searching for this stuff, looking what defensive measures are these people putting in? Well, oh, we put in a secure environment. OK, well, you take the, <laughs> the SD card out of the voting machine. There's no chain of custody. And then you take it to a county courthouse and then you put it on the same network that you have everything else on. That's already been hacked for a year that you didn't know about. So, yeah, no. Yep. Yeah, it sounds like the same old, same old, doesn't it? Yeah. It's very frustrating. I mean, the the optimist in me wants to go, oh, well, they're not going to tell anybody. They're obviously doing something. They're just not going to tell anybody because they don't. But, yeah, I don't. The, that optimist is about that big compared to my <laughs> pessimistic. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, man. Well, again, scary stuff, worrying stuff. Um, I, I, I like the visibility of it. I think, um, you know, having the UK's prime minister say something about it at the same time, the article was very quick to say, well, he said we need to do some stuff, but he didn't say what we were doing to your point. So I don't know, man, it's, uh, I, I think with the advent of like, even though it's critical infrastructure, but the look at elections as critical infrastructure, you know, with CISA and things like that, there's some things, at least some, some organizations and departments being put in place to help protect some of this, but it's, it's a never ending battle and it just always will be. So anyway, okay. Now we've scared everybody to death. So, um, but your election process is completely secure. No problems whatsoever. All right. Well on that, let's take a quick break. And on the other side of this break, we will get into talking about you, David, talk about your, uh, your life, how you got into this. And then we'll uh, talk about your talk at HUSECCON in 2023. So on the other side of the break, we'll get into it. And we are back. So David, let's talk about you, sir. So uh, Sam and I have known you for a while and we've been in the, you were, when you were down here in Houston for a while, we obviously ran across you all the time, went to a lot of your talks. Again, you Spoken HUSECCON a few times at HUSECCON B-Side or Houston, B-Sides Houston uh, back in the day. But give us a idea of kind of why you got into cyber, why you just got into this field in general, IT, whatever, and kind of just give us a rundown what some of your passions are. I know some of your, you like to do some pen testing and some offensive security stuff. So get into it, man. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I started, you know, way back in the day after I got out of the military and stuff and, uh, I went to work for a friend of mine and I was repairing computers, literally just repairing Macs and, and different things. And, uh, that's when networking started going. And, you know, he, my boss at the time gave me this challenge is like, hook, get this network hooked up, have all these computers talking, and then we can drop it off at the school next week. 
and I struggled and struggled and man, it, he didn't let, he didn't come in and help me at all. I just kept going, going, going. And this was with coax and, you know, I had to make sure I had the terminators and all this kind of crazy stuff. And, uh, I mean, that's kind of where I started. I love seeing how all the connectivity works. It, and I love, I, I live at the ones and zeros. I mean, my, I, if I could make a sniffer, my desktop, I probably would, uh, cause I live at the packet layer most of the time and, uh, which has helped me, uh, on a bunch of different things, but, uh, yeah, I really like doing that. And then I got into, you know, securing networks. Cause I, and this is when the DaVinci virus came out people were like, Oh mm-hmm. man, it's going to wipe our stuff out. How do we keep our stuff protected? And it really started around law firms and CPAs. I really, mm-hmm. I did a bunch of those and it was like, man, they have all this critical data that no one's supposed to get to. And, uh, I actually saw a hack real time. I was at this client's office and somebody was, re- was remoted in. They had a PC anywhere box running, if you can believe that. And someone dialed into it and was just starting to download stuff out of the CPA firm. And I was like, well, that doesn't, that's not right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, then I just, I just kind of pivoted all the way over from doing servers and networks to just seeing how these people were finding this stuff from war dialing to, you know, and that's where I really kind of got into pen testing. I wanted to find those holes and uh, I got pretty good at finding those holes. So um, knock on wood, I still do that. I actually just finished up a pen test in Texas at a bank just uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, just delivered the report about three hours ago. And, uh, you know, it was funny. I'll tell you this funny story. I was in the elevator at this hotel and uh, a bunch of state troopers were there uh, doing training, you know, and I had like eight of them get on the elevator with me. And I said, hey, guys, what are y'all doing? And they said, oh, we're just doing some training from across Texas and da 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 was like, uh, and they go, oh, well, what do you do? I said, well, I, I, I'm here to rob a bank. And uh, the, 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 look, the look on their face was just priceless. I, I wish I would have taken a selfie. I'm always good at taking selfies, but all these state troopers like, what are you talking about? And it was my floor. And I had four of them walk off the elevator with me because they wanted to hear more. They wanted to hear what was happening. And so I, I ended up talking to these guys for about 30 minutes, explaining, you know, what I do and how I break into banks. And, you know, uh, so that, that was really, really entertaining. It, and that's that's what I love. I love seeing how people react to that stuff and showing how this stuff is vulnerable, uh, patching those holes. Now, I've been on both sides, right? The blue team, the red team. Um, you know, I've helped out on both sides. Because if the blue team, it's real, their hard job is really, really hard, but they, they've got to know what the red teams are doing. I mean, yes, you can protect your assets and you could put all these protections in, but if you don't know the logic that I'm coming in at you or, you know, an actual attacker or a nation state, mm-hmm. that's kind of my specialty is uh, nation states and uh, the tools and techniques around that. And, uh, it's always fascinating to me how some of this stuff comes up with, you know, anything from like uh, the vault seven vault eight, you know, hacks back in back. What almost five years ago now, uh, but the CIA going after the microphones and, you know, Samsung televisions Mm. and stuff so they could spy on people. Um, That that's always fascinating with me. So, I mean, I have a whole collection of stuff behind me or actually in front of me of, I have lots of hacking tools where I'm doing stuff for customers. Um, because companies will send me stuff, you know, it's like, Dave, can you reverse engineer this? How do you, how would you get into this? And uh, so my son calls it Christmas most of the time because the UPS guy drops off and goes, oh, what are you going to break into today, dad? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's uh, kind of me. I mean, my background really is around pen testing iron forensics. Uh, I've, I've been a, a QSA. I've done PCI audits. I was a HIPAA auditor uh, for a little while. Um, that one was I don't know if it's like watching paint dry, but pretty close. Uh, but uh, I've yeah. had a couple of those audits get done because I've been in healthcare and security. Uh, so yeah, those, those aren't. Fun. I had security, I had HIPAA and PCI oh, at, yeah. at almost the same time. So uh, yeah, not fun. Well, well, thanks for the background, man. It's it's a lot. It's um, it's a you know it's very fun to do the pen testing stuff. Everybody still. And nobody that's watching this probably thinks it's like a movie or something, you know, that most people watching this know what it's like, but it's yeah. um, getting, I, I would have loved to have seen the faces of those, those guys though. <laughs> it, it was priceless. 
Yeah, I'm glad you didn't I get bet you they down stayed on the elevator if you were telling them you were there for a, for a uh, HIPAA audit. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't want to put anybody to sleep. So, yeah. But they would have known what HIPAA was, though. Almost everybody does, or to some degree, they at least know <laughs> right? yeah. something about it. So, all right. Well, thanks for the rundown, David. Uh, so let's let's talk about your uh, your talk at HUSECON. So you talked about insider threat, and I told you earlier when we were kind of talking about what the content was going to be that I had. There's nothing super interesting, but it just it struck me as when I saw your opening, when you were showing the cables to everybody, um, and what was in the cables, and you can explain that, but. I, what, what struck me about it is when you were talking about cables and being able to plug those in and use those and they don't, they look like cables, but they're not, they've got more to them. Um, that's not what people typically think about in their head when they think about insider threat. So you, does that make sense? Uh -huh. It's oh, yeah. most people think of insider threat as, you know, somebody's downloading something to steal it or, or they're just, you got a, a user who's not too bright and is, clicking on things, but they don't think about that aspect of somebody maybe using a tool like that. So kind of give me, if you would, a rundown of how you kind of combine those, correlate them to the cable to an insider threat versus that being a external type of thing. Oh, for sure. Great question. Um, neat insight. I, I don't think anybody's ever seen the parallel there. Uh, they get it after my talk, but, uh, uh, I think the big thing, you know, a lot of the reason I like to show some of the tools and, and talk about techniques and stuff is, you know, I've worked a lot of insider threat cases, uh, especially with law enforcement around the world. Uh, I've worked with, you know, Interpol, Europol, um, HPD in Houston. I've worked with them and uh, some three letter agencies as well. And it's interesting you say insider threats and you're right. It's all over the place. It's like, Oh yeah, it's, it's a disgruntled employee. That's what I normally get. Oh, it's a disgruntled employee. And I said, well, no, not necessarily because uh, what if it's someone like myself or an actual, you know, nation state and they want to get into your environment and you have everything air gapped. You know, if we look at Stuxnet, how did they get in? They got in because they had a special USB drive, not, not really special, but it had special software on it that could infect something and it was totally air gapped. Uh, I actually have still have a copy of Stuxnet running in my lab, but uh, you know, dealing with the cables, you know, we used to do in pen testing um, USB drops. We would drop a USB. Hopefully someone would plug it in. Uh, but now I just, I carry uh, charging cables that look just like an Apple charging cable. So, and I'll actually look at the phones. If I'm like scoping a client out or something, um, I'm actually looking at the phones that are going in the building. Uh, that will determine, it, is it a white cable or is it a black cable? Because if it's a black cable, I know there's a bunch of Android phones mm -hmm. versus a bunch of Apple. And guarantee, I could drop those anywhere, especially in waiting rooms. Uh, I'll leave a char I've left a charger there and people just pick it up and they'll just use it, you know, and they'll plug it in. But they don't realize inside that, unless you have an x-ray, you're not going to know what's there. Uh, it's going to be totally hidden, totally obscure. And guess what? I'm sitting in the parking lot with my laptop waiting for that thing to check in. As soon as it checks in, because it has its, the, the, the length of the cable is the Wi-Fi antenna uh, or Bluetooth. I have some that are Bluetooth as well. And then talks back to me. Boom. I, I've got you. I can own you all day long. Um, then I talk in my talk, I talk about uh, not just uh, the bad insiders, but the good insider threats, right? And they're not really a threat, but they're the ones that help you out the most. And a, a great example of that was when um, uh, Tesla, a couple years ago, uh, two Russian guys came in and grabbed a, I think he was like 28 years old, a software engineer working in Tesla in California. And they said, hey, we'll pay you $500,000. All you have to do is put this USB drive in that computer. That's all you got to do. And we'll trade. He's like, Luckily, he was a great insider because he went to instantly to Tesla security, which called the FBI. They set up a sting. Uh, they caught these two guys. They had them on. Uh, it was like a, a thing out of NCI, NCIS, right? They had uh, a diner set up. Everyone in the diner was an FBI agent. They recorded everything, uh, and they got these guys, right, um, to, to stop this act because these guys wanted to ransom 
the Gigafactory. So can you imagine shutting down a Gigafactory or Tesla? I mean, it's just mind boggling uh, because they run 24 seven. You know, I was just in Austin uh, recently and drove right past the Gigafactory and they're, it's huge and they're building even more to it because they run, you know, like three shifts a day because they got to make batteries and uh, they got to make Michael Cybertruck, which I'm sure he'll be getting. Uh, so <laughs> Right next to my Tundra. That's right. Next to your Tundra. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, there's that. And then what about the insiders that you don't even know that are there? And those are the mm-hmm. most scariest ones is people like, oh man, we've got all these great defenses. We have EDR, we have this, we have that. Uh, but man, we don't know what happened. And I always ask them the same question. I was like, okay, are you watching all your outbound traffic? And they're all like, well, no. I'm like, why not? Why don't you know? And it just blows my mind when you see some of these big hack, big breaches, and they're like, oh, we lost 14 terabytes of data. Okay, you didn't see 14 terabytes disappear out of your... I mean, the network team should be able to see the net flows and says, okay, on an average day, 300 gig is going out our environment. Why is it three terabytes a day? I mean, there's a problem there that people don't miss. Um, I don't know if you caught in my talk, one of the pictures, I'm, I guess, known for showing funny pictures. Actually, one of the pictures I show was a uh, circuit board that was wired, soldered onto a Cisco switch. Totally hidden, totally out of band. Guess where it talked to? <coughs> China. Sorry, had a cough. <laughs> but that's the thing, right? It's finding that kind of stuff. How do you find that? You know, most companies, 99.9% of customers are not prepared for that kind of stuff. Uh, they're just doing everything they can to, you know, keep the IT functions going. Yeah. And, well, if uh, we're not going to let Huawei in here, then they've got to do something to get on the Cisco switches. So a- Exactly. I mean, <laughs> and you can look up counterfeit Cisco switches and they're everywhere. Uh, yeah. There's a big black market around, especially for SMB buying, you know, these counterfeit uh, boxes out of China, out of Taiwan, uh, wherever else. And uh, it's a serious problem because people just don't know what's on them. Well, it was, I heard, I didn't, I haven't seen any of the data on it, but I heard that that was a big problem during the supply chain issues. Cause you know, I don't know if people know that Cisco was, I mean, 400 over a year backed up and being able to deliver some stuff and people were going out and finding stuff on eBay and everything else. And then if you're SMB, I mean, you're super cost conscious to begin with. You're, you're doing things that may seem a natural purchasing person is not necessarily the one that's going to audit for security. Right. And, or, you know, the origins and things like that. And that's the other uh, challenge with that is it, not to mention, we all know how my, many security resources the SMB market has, right? They typically don't. And so, you know, that, that, that's the other challenge with it. So it comes down to like, it's a terrible situation because we can't trust anybody or anything anymore. Right. It's just, it's ridiculous. And by the way, if anybody ever sits through one of Dave, David's talks, you will come out r- realizing you cannot trust anybody anymore. So um, anyway, be prepared. <laughs> you can trust me. The first, um, I remember the very first talk that I saw you give. I'm trying to remember the example because I I blatantly stole it, honestly, for a talk that I gave. And I, I, <laughs> I'm i not going to apologize because I think we all okay. steal people's stuff. But <laughs> right. it, I, oh, man, I cannot remember the story. But I, it, what struck me more than just the story was I was w- doing what I normally do. I sit in the I sit either I'll sit in the front and I'll heckle whoever I'm talking, whoever's talking because they're friend. I think I've done that to you a couple of times or I'll sit in the back and try to part on the side and gauge people's faces. And I just remember this lady in the audience. Like I, I don't think I'd ever seen somebody's jaw literally fall open that fast. Like she was just like, and there's something I, I wish I could remember it, but it just struck her and she was a seasoned security professional. I mean, I, I, I know who this person is. And you talked about some, and she, it it was like that directly affects me. I'm very worried now, <laughs> and it was. But I mean, it, how else are you going to raise awareness of this stuff if you don't let people know? You're right, and you know. And one last thought on like the insider threats is you know SMB. There's so much outsourcing going on. So guess what? You have a lot of lot new, lot more insiders that were not in your network before. 
And guess what? You're paying them. Um, so you don't know if that third party has been breached in getting into your stuff. Um, you know, I gave a, um, a talk several months ago on open source software and security risk and not whatnot. And that was one of the questions people asked me. It's like, Dave, what do we do where we have outside contractors or we've hired this cloud company to provide such and such service? Uh, they're moder- They're an MSP or they're monitoring our stuff. Um, it's like audit the auditors almost at that point. But it, it comes down to what Sam was saying. The SMB market especially uh, doesn't have the resources or the time. So do I hire two companies and have them checks and balance each other? I mean, there's all kinds of, and there's financial concerns, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the biggest thing, you know, of course, people are going to go, oh, ransomware and all that stuff. Uh, but believe it or not, some of these ransomware groups, especially the Conte group, they were hiring insiders. That was one of their um, 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 motive and operatives where they would go and go to a company. They would research the person, uh, grab, of course, all their stuff on LinkedIn, all their socials, and then says, hey, by the way, we have uh, your medical information. We know that you're sick or whatever. We're going to tell the world if you don't do this for us. Uh, it's happened. It's happened in Sweden, Denmark, Norway. I mean, I've, there's just case after case of this crazy stuff happening. And they turn into insiders and people just don't even realize it. Uh, of course, we've got malicious insiders. And like you were saying, Michael, uh, the guy sitting there, click, 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 click. Uh, what's this directory? Oh, and just follows this directory structure. And they get into something. They weren't being malicious. They were just, you know, they're they're showing the IT department that, hey, you gave me full access to something I don't, I don't, I'm not supposed to have full access to. Uh, so, I mean, I definitely see that before. I mean, I saw a company years ago as an insurance company actually um, in Houston. I won't, I won't say their name, but uh, uh, they wanted to take one of their employees to court and fire them because of that exact scenario. They thought this person was stealing information and it definitely wasn't, this person, after we did the forensics on the box and everything, we could clearly see that not only did he look, look at a directory that he quote, wasn't supposed to, he didn't do anything with it. But then we found out his machine had malware already on it, uh, that he had no idea that was watching what he was doing. So it's, uh, it can definitely go sideways very, very quickly. Sam, any thoughts? No, I mean, I've, I've been in that situation, right? I've done quite a few startups and um, I've been in smaller environments where you can like click through, especially some of the older Windows directories and such where you just click through and all of a sudden, boom, you're in an HR, you see what everybody else's payroll looks like and and personal information and stuff. And I'm like, that shouldn't be there. But if you're not, again, it's an SMB problem, right? In that sense, is if you don't know what you're doing and, um, you know, you, you can easily go down a route unintentionally of, of breaching your own self. Um, you know, so that's, well, that's a, it. Sorry to interrupt you, but I mean, it's, no, no. it's a conversation for another time because we don't, we need to yeah. shut this off. But I think what, what you're talking about, Sam is absolutely a major problem with um, to use, sorry to use the, it's not a buzzword. It is what it is. The AI stuff, like especially like Copilot, things like that. If you don't have your data access policies set up yes. in place, and you're letting these AI tools unleash, get unleashed in your environment to go through all of your documentation, and you can ask it questions, you, it's going to come back and tell you. And even if you've got filtering in those tools to not let certain questions being asked, we all seen how you can get around those things. Um, so that's a whole nother insider threat vector that, um, again, we need to, we need to shut this down, unfortunately, but we could talk about that on another show, David, and if that's something you're putting in your talks going forward. Yes. Uh, I actually just, there was an announcement from, uh, and this just is going into a talk right now. Uh, another security talk that I'm working on is, uh, Microsoft just announced yesterday that they're going to force OEMs to quote, buy a license, just like you license windows. When you buy a new PC, Mm -hmm. guess what? They're going to have a license for Copilot and force it on those machines. 
I mean, to me, that's yep. that's a huge security issue. It's like same way they've done teams, right? They've forced teams on everybody. <laughs> exactly on everybody. Scary stuff. Well, David, thanks so much, man, for coming on. Um, I I suspect we'll see you uh, put another talk in the call for papers for um, this this coming twenty twenty four, right? I will. I've I've got two talks ready uh, for that. And that's I did good because we're going to need, you... need those slide decks at least three months in advance. You know that, right? So I was going to say that, and I was going to say you're still you're still lobbying for a keynote spot. So I, we'll I am. It's uh, yeah. please see my uh, petition.org site for uh, Dave's <laughs> keynote uh, selection at HughesetCon one of these days. Those were both. If you get thrown in jail area. anytime soon, we'll bring you back as a keynote. How about that? <laughs> Absolutely. Get get thrown in jail. Use your get get out of jail free card to get out of there, and then you'll become an immediate sensation. So. Oh, I I almost did. I almost had four state troopers tag take me out. So <laughs> does, does that yeah, count? I mean, that's that's got to count you can or something. Set that up next <laughs> time. Go, hey man, put me in handcuffs and take a picture, and I want to put that on my. <laughs> And good thing you didn't. Uh, good thing you didn't tell them about the whole key card and uh, access on the rest of the the floors, right? So that's that would have cost you another thirty oh minutes in the hallway. It's uh, I, I'm definitely the you know, I I get the most free hugs from the TSA because when they look at my bag under the X ray machine, uh, especially when I'm going on a pen test, and I have so many tools in there, uh, and they're it's like, what is this? What is this? And they never question like my lock picks. They never question that. It's all of these other. It's like, why do you have so many wires and all this other stuff? And, you know. They want to know. All right, sir. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate you being on here on episode 18 and uh, looking forward to seeing your talk submitted for 2024. Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. Yep, absolutely. Sam, parting thoughts, sir. And this, this just keeps getting better and better. I can't wait for number 19 to come out. Right. And so, and, yeah. and I will say, I'm super excited about seeing everybody at the end of April, right. At the Otset con. So oh, the yeah. in-person cons are always fun and uh, you know, looking forward to that too. So same here, same here. And then exec set con after that. And then the big dog in September, a lot of good things. All right, everybody. Well, thanks for listening to episode 18. Like Sam said, we will see you soon on episode 19 with uh, more great content. Probably won't top this one because David's <laughs> the best, but we'll try. All right, everybody. See you next time.